if you were to take all of the living things on Earth and arrange them into what part of the fossil record that they are known from, the animals, uh, the vertebrates here, the invertebrates, they are only known from the most recent time period, certainly from the Phanerozoic and with invertebrates a little bit earlier in this section here, which is uh, yellow. Um, uh, for the longest time, if you go, were to go back to the beginning of life on Earth, um, I, I'm sorry, to the beginning of Earth's history, uh, there was no life on Earth in this black section. So from about 4.6 billion years ago uh, to around uh, 3.5 billion years ago, our planet was a dead rock in space, as far as we can tell. Um, and then life appeared but the only living things were prokaryotes, bacterial cells. And they had the planet to themselves for about a billion and a half years, about a third of the history of life on Earth. Um, but then shortly after cyanobacteria added oxygen to the atmosphere, a new type of cell evolved, a more complex cell that on average was larger, had internal membrane-bound organelles like that. Um, a nucleus and mitochondria, uh, and that this new type of cell, the eukaryotic cell, evolved. And so from that point in history, eukaryotes uh, then uh, were included in life on Earth. Now, uh, we are familiar with some groups of eukaryotes, which are multicellular. Uh, so the animals, the plants, and almost all of the fungi, yeast are unicellular, but the rest of the fungi are multicellular. Um, but then there are simpler eukaryotes as uh, well. Um, now, as I'll discuss, the name protist isn't a good name, um, but let's just use it tentatively for now. Um, the eukaryotes, which are not plants, animals, or fungi, are called protist. Protist first appear about two billion years uh, ago and have existed in the fossil record since uh, that, uh, that point. Now, these eukaryotic cells are interesting for a lot of uh, reasons. So as I'll go through uh, in a little bit, obviously they form parts of food chains. Algae are doing photosynthesis. Some can cause diseases in humans like malaria and other uh, diseases. Uh, uh, but another reason to be interested in them is that we humans are eukaryotes. So if you were to take all living things, bacteria are not eukaryotes. Um, but the things which are eukaryotes, they share features. So not only does an amoeba, a paramecia, have a nucleus and mitochondria, etc., cetera, um, but then so do I. And so eukaryotes form a group that share features which evolved during that time period on the previous image in green when the ancestral eukaryotes were developing traits which all later uh, eukaryotes would have. Um, so Golgi, uh, when you look at this amoeba moving, it's similar to how white blood cells move because uh, the eukaryotic uh, cytoskeleton is different from the cytoskeleton of bacteria and can be manipulated uh, in this way. When you look at all of these bags, these vesicles inside, um, that's atypical of uh, bacteria, but uh, these eukaryotes have it. Um, the cilia and flagella in eukaryotes is different from the two types which are found in uh, bacteria. Uh, and so the cilia around a paramecium and the cilia lining the trachea of a person's uh, throat are the same structures. When we look at how cells divide, bacteria don't undergo mitosis with anaphase and prophase and a mitotic spindle, etc. Um, but the eukaryotes uh, do, whether it be a one-celled uh, amoeba or the cells of, uh, of a human. Um, and so eukaryotes are important because we share all of these features, uh, which evolved uh, early in the history of uh, of uh, the eukaryotes. How could eukaryotes evolve? Well, one of the important aspects um, <clears throat> uh, was the addition of these membrane-bound internal organelles. Now, to be honest, um, the last I checked, there is no clear consensus on where a nucleus comes from. Now, perhaps it isn't that major a question in that there are bacteria which wrap their DNA in a membrane. And so if bacteria wrap their DNA in a membrane, um, this actually might be an older feature which predates eukaryotes, or maybe it's something that evolved multiple 
uh, at times. There are more complex uh, ideas, such as the idea of um, a cell living inside another uh, uh, cell. Um, but last I checked, there wasn't a good you know, set of evidence supporting one idea or uh, another. So while the uh, nucleus is a defining feature of the eukaryotes, uh, where it might have come from, um, still a matter uh, you know, for, uh, for new hypotheses. However, the next largest organelles in the eukaryotic cell, it is clear where they came from. And so if you were to consider mitochondria or chloroplasts, they seem to be cells living inside other cells, endosymbionts. Now, that's not usually what happens. So lots of cells ingest other cells. They do it as a source of food. And so big cells can ingest blue-green algae or, back, uh, or other kinds of bacteria. And then uh, this process is known as phagocytosis. And then uh, this uh, organism can then be ingested, digested, broken down for food, uh, et cetera. Um, however, uh, so here are lysosomes coming, which will bring digestive enzymes, which help to break down uh, this uh, one-celled organism, uh, which is used for food. There is, however, another possibility, which happens from time uh, to time. It is possible that this uh, one uh, small cell inside the big cell uh, is not destroyed. Now, sometimes a small cell is actually a parasite um, where it's causing a disease. Uh, and so sometimes the small cell wants to prey on the large cell and evades it. But there are times where they both help each other, that the big cell provides something to the little cell, you know, perhaps a way to, to live, for example. Um, the little cell provides something for uh, the big uh, cell, and together they have a symbiotic relationship. And because one lives inside the other, that it is referred to as endosymbiosis. Now, as I'll get to at the end, um, we certainly know that endosymbiosis uh, has occurred more recently, and there are plenty of examples of it, and I'll be mentioning a couple. Um, but the idea then is uh, that when you look inside a eukaryotic cell and you see mitochondria, which are the second largest organelles in uh, human cells after the nucleus, or mitochondria and chloroplasts, say inside uh, the cells of plants, um, that these then would be the descendants of bacteria, which learned to live inside earlier cells, and that the eukaryotic cell in large part would have been born from this endosymbiosis. So those events were living things, say a proteobacterium that learned to live inside bigger cells would be the ancestor of the mitochondria. Or cyanobacteria learning to live inside other cells would be uh, the ancestors of chloroplasts. Now, um, why would you say this? Well, because mitochondria and chloroplasts, they're the size of bacteria. They're the shape of bacteria. They divide by binary fission, as do uh, bacteria. And the only way that a cell gets more mitochondria or chloroplast is if the existing mitochondria or chloroplast divide. The nucleus doesn't have genes to make mitochondria and chloroplast. If you remove the mitochondria or chloroplast uh, from uh, a cell, it can't make any new ones. These uh, organelles have their own chromosomes. So not all of an organism's DNA is in the nucleus. Um, it has its own chromosome and the chromosomes are circular as in uh, bacteria. And there's a number of other things which remind us of bacteria. So for example, the way that mitochondria and chloroplasts start making their proteins, the uh, DNA codons that they uh, use, the antibiotics that they're susceptible to, are all uh, those uh, uh, which correlate with bacteria, not with the remainder of the uh, eukaryotic uh, cell. And so um, there's a great deal of evidence which indicates that mitochondria are descended from uh, uh, bacteria, which learn to live in the first uh, eukaryotic cells, that chloroplasts are descended from cyanobacteria, which learn to live inside uh, early uh, eukaryotic uh, cells. So that marked 
at the beginning of a eukaryote, um, but that cell that ingested the endosymbionts would have had to have already had some differences. So for example, it has a different type of cytoskeleton compared uh, to uh, bacteria, which allows it to perform that phagocytosis, uh, where little extensions of the uh, cell called pseudopods or false feet will reach around and engulf uh, a, uh, an object outside uh, the cell, such as a, um, a bacterium. Now, lots of uh, cells, including human white blood cells, then digest this bacterium and can use it as, uh, as food. Uh, but uh, this type of cytoskeleton uh, you know, was also something in the basal uh, eukaryotes. Now, um, because this type of cell originated two billion years ago, um, there has certainly been a lot of uh, opportunity for the branching of a family uh, tree. And to get insight into uh, the origins of eukaryotes, it would be of interest to potentially find the most primitive branches. The first branches might have uh, the uh, traits uh, which you know inform us of what the early eukaryotes uh, were like. Um, and although it isn't you know absolutely uh, certain, it seems as if Giardia, which is a common intestinal parasite, is the most basal branch. So that if you wanted to get a glimpse of what the first eukaryotes uh, look like, that uh, Giardia uh, would be uh, that um, uh, that organism. Uh, there are a number of, so once again, uh, we can argue about the branching of the family tree, and, and I will uh, in just a little bit. Um, it's possible uh, that uh, if you look at the earliest uh, branch, uh, so if you know animals and their relatives are here, or fungi and their relatives are here, if plants and their relatives are here, that the very mo the most primitive of the branches would have been um, a giardia. Uh, the reason, or the, among the reasons to say that, uh, is that uh, it thrives in low oxygen, and we think that the first eukaryotes would have lived in a world with much less uh, oxygen. Um, uh, also, uh, it is you know, possible that this is also a not inherited from the first eukaryotes, but rather um, an adaptation to live inside uh, intestines, however. Um, the uh, mitochondria of uh, Giardia um, can't technically be called mitochondria, but they do have organelles which are similar. Uh, they're called mitosomes. So the idea is that the ancestral eukaryotes engulfed a bacterium, which would later change, losing much of its autonomy and become the mitochondria, but that Giardia represent a branch in the family tree after the endosymbiosis, but before the subsequent changes, which made it a, um, uh, a, an actual uh, mitochondria. Um, other uh, ops, uh, problems are um, eukaryotes are typically sexual. It was the early eukaryotes which involved sexual reproduction. But the fact that giardia are asexual does that mean they still retain an early uh, condition um, prior to the evolution of uh, sexual reproduction? They, even though Jari is not known to reproduce sexually, um, it does seemingly possess genes uh, which allow for meiosis. Does that mean it has sex on rare occasions, uh, perhaps so rarely that it hasn't been uh, observed? Other potentially primitive features, there's no Golgi, uh, no primordial, uh, although there are primordial Golgi uh, known as uh, encystation specific uh, vesicles. So um, this is not certain, and among biologists there has been you know, great you know, discussion and reorganization of the uh, protist family tree to get the best groupings, um, but it is fairly consistently uh, concluded that Giardia represent an early uh, branch uh, to um, uh, this protist group. Now, there, you saw that family tree. There are so many groups, and they are so distinct from each other. Some of them have been 
diverging in the family tree for you know close to two billion years they are very different and so at some point then you just kind of have to run through the diversity of protist groups one group are called the euglenozoans and here you can see the common euglena very often examined in uh, labs uh, for a number of reasons uh, they move by way of a flagellum so flagellum uh, and you can barely make it out uh, there uh, and cilia are uh, identical uh, as far as their structure. The only difference is that uh, cilia are small and uh, the flagella are much uh, longer. So this euglenozoan uh, moves by way of a flagellum. And notice all of these green bodies inside, which allow it to do uh, photosynthesis. Now, um, while this is a commonly observed euglenozoan, this euglena, um, it's not the ancestral form in that the majority of euglenozoans do not have those restructures and um, do for synthesis. So it seems like, say, for example, if we were to look um, at this trypanosome, which is a euglenozoan, which can cause diseases in humans. So here you see it in the human bloodstream. I notice that it has a flagella, but notice that it is not staining uh, green. That's because this is a parasite. It is not um, uh, it is not photosynthetic. Now, uh, and when I say it has a, uh, uh, a flagellum, technically, um, there's one long flagellum, and technically there's a second little flagellum here, a second one that helps uh, with steering. So this one's more for propulsion, this one's more for uh, direction. Um, so uh, while about a third of euglenozoans can perform photosynthesis, that doesn't seem to be the ancestral state of the group. The majority of them can't do it. And the photosynthesis is done by these structures. So uh, remember that uh, some protists, like the green algae, seem to have uh, gotten uh, another uh, uh, organism inside them, which became the chloroplast uh, through endosymbiosis. Um, this seems to be uh, what happened here as well, not a primary uh, endosymbiosis, which occurred very early in uh, eukaryotic evolution, um, but uh, a more recent secondary uh, endosymbiosis. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, the euglenozoans, they are one uh, group of protists. Um, they are asexual. There are a couple of uh, protist groups like dinoflagellates and euglenozoans, uh, which are not known to reproduce sexually. Here is another group of um, uh, amoebas uh, or uh, uh, protists uh, known as uh, amoeba. Uh, now, um, amoeba is the term is sometimes used to describe protists which are not closely related to each other, but I'll get back to that. Um, they can be large. Um, Protists. So there you could see lots of small ciliates, which are also eukaryotes swimming around it. So eukaryotic so uh, cells uh, can vary uh, significantly uh, in size. And here you can see an amoeba. Clearly it's a eukaryote. Uh, there's a central uh, nucleus. Uh, there's all of these other membrane bound organelles. And look at the cytoskeleton. Uh, it can be dismantled and reassembled. And that's how these amoeba move they kind of uh, take apart their cytoskeleton in one part of the body, say over here, and then reconstruct it kind of in front of them. So they more or less uh, rebuild their skeleton in front of them and then flow into it. Uh, this allows to, them to create these um, pseudopods, these uh, false uh, feet, which want to uh, engulf things and perform phagocytosis. Uh, and so uh, these are making their living by eating other uh, living things. Uh, single. Uh, so. Now, uh, this type of movement involved early in history of um, eukaryotes because members of the circle of this type of movement, uh, even animals, uh, animals typically have a subject of the cells are capable of moving in any way, uh, fashion. Uh, they are diverse, so these groups uh, are uh, diverse and, and include a number of different lifestyles and sizes. So, for example, here is an amoeba known as Chaos Chaos, genus and species name. Um, it has multiple uh, nuclei, it is a giant cell, and it is actually big enough to see without a microscope. Um, and so uh, there are some cells, some amoebas, some ciliates, which can actually measure a couple millimeters in size. 
And so if you were to look at a microscope slide, even before you put it under the microscope, you would be actual, uh, actually be able to see uh, these, uh, 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 these, uh, uh, these uh, cells. So uh, amoebas are uh, uh, protists, uh, and there are even some that cause disease, like amoebic dysentery. Um, another phyla of uh, protists are the ciliates, and it is quite a diverse phylum. Now, I, I think many people are familiar with uh, paramecia. This is a group of, uh, of smaller, um, uh, of uh, smaller uh, ciliates, um, but they are quite diverse. To take a closer look at, at paramecium, uh, notice it is a eukaryotic cell. There's a nucleus. Uh, there's membrane-bound organelles. Um, there is a groove uh, uh, where uh, food can be ingested. Uh, there can be a vacuole uh, or multiple uh, vacuoles so that this can uh, take water that then gets expelled. Uh, uh, this is an advantage for living in fresh water where water is attempting to live in the cells. Uh, there's lots of other membrane-bound organelles here, but obviously one of the striking features are the cilia. So while euglenozoans have a single, or that pair of uh, flagella, here are the ciliates are covered by uh, cilia, which uh, then uh, are their form of uh, propulsion. Um, uh, these cilia have the same structure as the cilia which in humans line the trachea or line the oviduct. Uh, so here you can see lots uh, of, uh, of cilia uh, uh, contracting, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, moving, uh, moving there. Okay. Uh, now, uh, sexual reproduction evolved uh, early in uh, eukaryotes, um, but because it evolved so early, there are some major differences in how sexual reproduction occurs in different groups of ciliates, or I'm sorry, different groups of protists. So ciliates, for example, they have a, a complex, unique form of sexual reproduction. So there are different strains, all right? So they don't really have male and female ages of different strains, and there can be more than two strains. Um, and they have what's called a macronucleus and a micronucleus, uh, okay? Uh, when two uh, ciliates encounter each other, uh, the micronucleus can then undergo meiosis, uh, now uh, getting half the number of chromosomes. Uh, three of the four daughter uh, nuclei, which are haploid, degenerate, leaving only one, and then that one uh, copies itself. So the one nucleus uh, then uh, undergoes mitosis, so now there are two haploid micronuclei. Um, the uh, micronucleus from one strain will then go into uh, the cell of the, uh, uh, of the opposite strain, so they change micronuclei. The micronuclei then fuse, and so you have two sets of, um, of genetic material now fusing. Two haploid um, as sets are now fusing to make one new diploid set. So this micronucleus is now diploid once again, but with information from two different parents. The original macronucleus uh, uh, breaks down. One of the two micro, uh, uh, the diploid micronucleus undergoes uh, mitosis, and one of the two daughter nuclei then becomes a new macronucleus. So once again, um, the, uh, 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 sexual reproduction evolved in, uh, in early uh, eukaryotes, um, but different, uh, but then has varied. And so the ciliates have a, a unique uh, type of uh, division. Now I'm starting off here by just reminding you that arthropods form a phylum. And so therefore there's a lot of difference between a millipede, a spider, an insect, a crab, etc. I mean, a phylum is a big taxonomic uh, group. But in the same way, and, you know, and mollusks form a phylum. So octopi and snails, you know, uh, are uh, in the same uh, phylum. Um, but in the same way, then we shouldn't be surprised uh, when we see all of the different um, uh, ciliates, which are in the phylum uh, ciliophora. And so there are. Uh, it is a phylum. And so when you look at these, you'll notice that they can vary great deal in size, in structure, um, but uh, what's the defining feature is uh, those uh, cilia uh, which uh, uh, hold them. So there are thousands of species which are known. 
um, and they can vary uh, in uh, size um, to the point where some are even visible uh, without a microscope uh, being so large. Uh, so here you can see you know, one that looks more elongate. All right, here you can see um, one that is more uh, goblet uh, shaped uh, at cell. Uh, and what uh, they uh, primarily do is that they can ingest um, uh, other microorganisms, particularly bacteria and blue-green algae. And so they can uh, sweep little currents uh, into a food uh, groove, uh, which allows them to uh, uh, to ingest what then uh, you know becomes their food. Um, some are anaerobic, uh, which allows uh, them uh, to live uh, in environments uh, that uh, the majority of them uh, could not uh, exist in. Uh, so here you can see one close up. Notice that is you know has that eukaryotic uh, structure with all of those internal membrane bound uh, organelles. Um, so uh, they vary a lot. Uh, and so uh, some, for example, uh, are not ingesting bacteria uh, the way uh, that the majority do, but are now simply taking in some of the fluid around them for nutrition. That is known as penocytosis. Um, some can do both phagocytosis and uh, penocytosis as um, uh, ways to obtain uh, energy. Um, and then some are actually photosynthetic. Um, because they have undergone uh, endosymbiosis. Uh, and notice there is some greenish color in this um, uh, uh, paramecium. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, endosymbiosis occurred uh, early in the history of the uh, eukaryotes, um, but then it can keep on occurring after that. And if so, uh, if uh, ciliates have ingested a a photosynthetic organism, um, then they could work out an arrangement where uh, the larger ciliate provides uh, nutrients for the um, uh, uh, for the uh, photosynthetic organism, which can then uh, uh, provide um, a sugar uh, because of uh, photosyn uh, photosynthesis. Um, another example of that is some uh, ciliates. Uh, can actually destroy coral animals which have um, uh, endosymbiotic uh, dinoflagellates uh, and these ciliates can ingest them, but they might actually keep them briefly uh, and so that they could actually do photosynthesis because they've ingested the photosynthetic endosymbi endosymbionts from uh, coral animals. Um, there is even one ciliate which is uh, capable of uh, causing uh, human infections, uh, which uh, can be potentially uh, life uh, threatening. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's diversity in uh, the ciliates. Now, uh, ciliates can reproduce sexually, but then they can also divide asexually as well. And under the microscope, uh, one can distinguish uh, between fission, uh, which is um, the asexual reproduction of ciliates that you see on the left, versus conjugation, which is the sexual reproduction, which you see on uh, the right. And so, uh, for example, something that, one is, uh, that often is observed in the wild uh, is that a species might reproduce asexually most of the time, but let, let's say that you know, a harsh environment kicks in, that that might be the trigger then to reproduce uh, sexually. Um, and so uh, we can find both forms of reproduction in ciliates, and you can see the uh, asexual fission on the left and the sexual conjugation then uh, on uh, the uh, right. Um, some ciliates have stalks that anchor them to a substrate, uh, and so then they can feed um, in the surrounding uh, solution, but they can then um, uh, either stay in one place, and this uh, ciliate um, is interesting because it can then contract that stalk, and uh, you know, then you can actually uh, watch it. You know, as it, you know, the the main uh, portion of the the ciliate then gets closer to the substrate. Um, again, so there's a great uh, diversity in uh, these uh, uh, these ciliates, and we'll we'll wait for it to contract all the time. There it is. Okay. Um, 
So uh, uh, once again, there are, are ciliates. And then if you, know, you look at microscope uh, slides, uh, some of them once again are so big that you, you don't need a microscope to see them, you know, or, and then they're just you know, huge. And so I have a couple of, um, uh, of uh, images of both the live ones uh, which are uh, very, very, uh, uh, um, which we can see here. Notice the cilia all around uh, the outside of uh, uh, of the body, and then I also have a couple of videos that go through prepared microscope slides um, uh, of uh, the larger uh, ciliates. And once again, you know, uh, that. All right, so. Spirostomum uh, and uh, blepharisma. Sorry, let me just get past that one. Moving on to the next uh, group of eukaryotes, uh, the foraminiferans. Uh, these are one of several protist uh, groups which make a shell around themselves. And I often, you know, preface this by and telling my students, you know, if you think of a slug, you know, I ask who likes slugs, who likes the diversity of slugs, and a lot of people. But then I say, well, how about snails? You know, because when one thinks of, you know, okay, say conch shells and a lot of the seashells which people collect or buy, you know, at the seashore, they're essentially snails. And snails are essentially slugs would then make a hard casing that they can protect themselves with. And in the same way, some protists um, have, you know, the soft, squishy cellular, you know, body, you know, which is typical of, say, an amoeba. Uh, but then they make a calcium carbonate shell around uh, themselves. So these foraminiferans, they make shells of calcium carbonate, and that's different from some other protist groups, which make a shell out of uh, silica. And it typically has multiple chambers. And so when you see that here, you can see, you know, here we are looking at multiple uh, chambers of uh, calcium uh, carbonate. Uh, now, not only is this interesting in uh, modern uh, groups, and it's so common that um, uh, there are some beaches uh, where uh, these uh, casings of uh, foraminiferans are so common. For example, you might say, oh, come to this tropical island. It has these wonderful pink sand beaches. Well, in reality, that's not sand. It's the casings of these microorganisms, just like you know, you could have empty, uh, you know, snail shells, um, which um, uh, would be, uh, you know, just uh, the remnants of uh, organisms which had died in uh, the past. Um, you could have uh, empty casings of uh, foraminiferans. Uh, another uh, group that does this are called the radiolarians. Um, they, uh, instead of calcium carbonate to make the half hard outer uh, shell around themselves, they are then using silica, which gives them more of a glassy uh, appearance. So we'll look at you know, their, um, their casing. Now in life, both of those might have, say, uh, amoeba-like uh, pseudopods extending from uh, them. So this is not the living organism. Instead, this is uh, you know just the shell of uh, the organism, just like a seashell, you know, is not the organism. There was a snail-like uh, animal uh, living inside, and once again, uh, uh, extensions of uh, that cell could uh, fill, uh, can slip through these holes, and then be um, and be used to feed, uh, etc. And so, uh, foraminiferans and radiolarians uh, are, um, are two groups of protists uh, which make a casing around themselves. And once again, in life, one would uh, see uh, not just uh, the casing, uh, but then uh, the extensions of the cytoplasm, uh, which would extend uh, through uh, those, uh, those pores. So, uh, those are uh, two uh, groups. Um, and something that I'll mention again when it comes uh, to uh, the diatoms. Uh, in addition to studying living members of uh, these groups, one could also then study um, extinct members of uh, these groups um, because uh, they fossilize better than most uh, microorganisms. 
So when one finds fossils, it's easier to find fossils of animals, say with bone or shells, because the hard stuff fossilizes uh, better. Um, but that's also true of microscopic life. Um, limestone is made of calcium carbonate. Lots of organisms make uh, calcium uh, carbonate, uh, many of which are animals, but this would include foraminiferans, all right? And so some limestone is made of foraminiferans. And so, you know, one can study fossil foraminiferans because they make these hard uh, shells, which can then uh, be studied under uh, the uh, microscope. Um, uh, in the same uh, way, um, organisms which then uh, uh, produce silica then can uh, contribute uh, to other minerals which have a lot of silica in it, uh, such as chert. Uh, so uh, diatoms uh, 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 make uh, uh, casings of, uh, of silica, as do the radiolarians as does a, a group which is uh, still alive uh, today, uh, but which was once uh, more uh, common known as uh, the, oh, oh, I'm sorry, my fault, I'm, I'm mixing something up. Um, and so uh, diatoms and uh, radiolarins, uh, because they're silica, wherever there's a lot of those, you could have a mineral known as a chert. Uh, one final group that's alive uh, today um, but is a minor component are known as the coccolithophores. Um, uh, and uh, they and other uh, things can contribute to chalk. And the Cretaceous period, literally, uh, creta is Latin for chalk. And so uh, uh, it was uh, this group of protists, uh, which primarily uh, was uh, contributing to the chalk uh, formations uh, during uh, that, uh, uh, that geologic time period. Uh, so a number of, uh, of protist groups have hard outer casings, and that would then be true um, of dinoflagellates as well. Now, dinoflagellates have two different uh, cilia. Uh, one kind of uh, runs uh, ar uh, around uh, the um, uh, around the, uh, the dinoflagellate um, in the uh, cingulum. Um, that's the transverse uh, flagellum. Well, then in uh, the uh, sulcus, uh, you have a, a second uh, flagellum, uh, which uh, the longitudinal flagellum, which can then be used uh, more for uh, propulsion. Uh, so these are uh, modal uh, protist uh, groups. Now, dinoflagellates are um, uh, important for a number of reasons, um, but then also just fascinating. Uh, and so, once again, uh, biologists study organisms for different reasons. So why might you be interested in dinoflagellates? Well, maybe because of the red tides, which can be fatal that they cause, as I'll mention. Maybe because of how important they are for coral reefs, as I'll uh, mention. Um, but then also uh, sometimes uh, just because of how odd uh, they are. So if you were to look inside the nucleus of a dinoflagellate, uh, one of the things uh, which is uh, amazing is that um, they substitute many of the thymine nucleotides uh, in their DNA with another one, hydroxy um, methyluracil. Uh, so that's of interest. A second thing uh, which uh, makes uh, them inter interesting is just the amount of DNA uh, that they have. So a typical alga has maybe half a picogram of DNA in a cell. Dinoflagellates can have 200 picograms of, um, of DNA per cell. The human genome has 3 billion nucleotides. Some dinoflagellates have that as a minimum, but it can be almost 100 times bigger. So they have an incredible amount of uh, DNA. And so, you know, once again, as we study biology, uh, you know, you could study it for this reason because it causes disease or that other reason. Um, but sometimes it's just fascinating in uh, general. Uh, as I will mention in much greater detail when I get into corals, uh, some of the most important um, dinoflagellates are those which can live inside corals. But before getting to that, um, dinoflagellates have a variety of lifestyles which are possible. Um, so some of them ingest other living things, so smaller cells. So they eat that uh, way. So, you know, they're 
predators of smaller cells, whether it be blue-green algae or bacteria or small protists. Some of them have um, endosymbionts uh, which can perform photosynthesis. Uh, that uh, often gives them a golden brown um, uh, uh, color. Uh, and so uh, these uh, dinoflagellates, uh, they can produce photosynthesis. This would be a secondary uh, endosymbiosis, which only some of them have, right? So after the first dinoflagellates involved, some of them evolve additional um, uh, endosymbioses, uh, which allow uh, them to perform photosynthesis. Now, some of them uh, are actually endosymbionts themselves. If you look inside coral animals, corals perform photosynthesis. They are animals, but they can do photosynthesis. And the reason they do photosynthesis is because they have dinoflagellates living inside them. Coral reefs are essential for marine life. So, much, so many of marine uh, fish depend on coral reefs, and there wouldn't be coral reefs if it wasn't for the dinoflagellate endosymbionts, which live inside the animal cells, allowing those animal cells to perform photosynthesis. These dinoflagellates are referred to as zoosanthellae. Um, they're often pigmented, and we refer to the bleaching of corals as something that can cause the death of corals and a global problem. Um, the bleaching of corals is when they lose these uh, endosymbionts uh, inside them. Now, because some of these dinoflagellates can produce a toxin, we worry about population booms uh, in these. So for example, red tides can be toxic to perhaps swimmers who are swimming in them, um, uh, because they could actually die from uh, the uh, toxins ingested, or maybe even just shellfish, which were harvested in areas where uh, the dinoflagellates were undergoing a uh, bloom uh, because they uh, ingest so much of this dinoflagellate toxin. Some dinoflagellates uh, can uh, then be bioluminescent. Uh, they can uh, uh, produce um, uh, molecules which release uh, light. Uh, and so if you've been to the Caribbean, uh, you might notice that, uh, especially when there's no moon, you might uh, notice that uh, you can see uh, streaks of bluish light in the water when the, the boat churns it up. Or if you're scuba diving, you may see little blue flashes in front of you. Those would be microscopic uh, protists, which are bioluminescent. Um, and so uh, dinoflagellates uh, are uh, of great interest. As I'll get into later, it is actually a serious global phenomenon threatening the, uh, the populations of fish in our ocean and the process of the bleaching of corals, uh, which is the loss of those endosymbiotic uh, zoosanthellae. And as you look at the first part of this video, where you see that a healthy a reef of living corals with their endosymbionts, and notice how colorful the coral reef is, um, that per, uh, supports uh, healthy populations of uh, fish. Whereas in the second part of this video, if you look at bleached coral, which looks whiter by comparison, notice that you don't see anywhere near the diversity of fish that you saw in healthy corals. And so because of climate change and other human activities, we are very concerned about the loss of dinoflagellate endosymbionts uh, from uh, corals. If you were to look at these dinoflagellates uh, under the microscope, uh, they clearly um, vary a great uh, deal. Uh, so the first one here is a, um, is a free-living uh, dinoflagellate. Right. And so once again, some of these are preying on microscopic organisms. Some of these are doing photosynthesis. Some of these are actually doing both. Right? A, a cell doesn't have to pick, I'm going to do phagocytosis, eat other things, or do photosynthesis. You can actually do both and get energy through both uh, ways. And here's a free-living um, uh, a free living uh, dinoflagellate serratium. Um, but then some are capable of other lifestyles. They can live inside other organisms as endosymbionts, or they could be parasites. And so this next uh, uh, slide that you see is of a uh, dinoflagellate, which is a parasite on the flesh of fish, oodinium. Um, and so that's the dinoflagellate, and that is the uh, 
uh, the skin of the fish that it is uh, parasitized. The next group of uh, protists that I'd like to mention are the diatoms. So diatoms are a second group which surround themselves in a, uh, a casing uh, or a frustule of silica. Um, uh, it's hard to metabolize silica, which is why so few groups actually use silica. Uh, but once you work out the mechanics of it, it's actually very energetic, very cheap to maintain. Uh, and so uh, therefore this is you know, uh, something uh, uh, very uh, valuable. Dinoflagellates are a common type of, um, of uh, a photosynthetic uh, organism um, because uh, they have uh, undergone a secondary endosymbiosis where they've ingested another organism capable of uh, photosynthesis. Um, now, when we study these under the microscope, sorry for Here you can see some diatoms taken from fresh water. Once again, they're a very uh, common type of photosynthetic uh, organism. Uh, they're uh, plastids inside that are performing photosynthesis, uh, often giving them a, a golden or a, a brownish uh, a, a color. Um, and notice that some of them are capable of movement. Now, there are different types of movement that you've already seen. So you've seen uh, that, you know, a protist can use flagella. You've seen in the ciliates that they can use lots of cilia. You've seen in amoeba that they can like reorganize their skeleton and kind of build it in front of them and flow into it. This is a different type of movement where uh, the uh, cell can kind of secrete a mucus and then absorb it uh, and thus use it, you know, uh, to uh, pull itself along and to glide along uh, the surface. So there are different forms of, um, uh, of movement uh, that one can find in uh, the protists. So here is, are these uh, diatoms. Uh, so not all diatoms are uh, mobile, uh, but some uh, do have uh, that, uh, that capability. Um, and so once again, this next uh, video just goes through a few things that I had said about uh, their plastids giving them a golden brown color, allowing them to perform um, uh, uh, photosynthesis. Um, this photosynthesis is actually uh, crucial. There are lots of diatoms in uh, the world and they perform so much photosynthesis that it would actually, it's estimated to uh, approximate the amount of photosynthesis coming from the rainforest of the world. All right, so if you were um, uh, then to, um, uh, to like, calculate how much oxygen is added to the air because of diatoms, once again, it approximates the, world, uh, the world's uh, rainforest. So that's very important. When you think of all that photosynthesis, that's carbon they're removing from uh, the atmosphere, uh, which is uh, helping to protect us uh, from climate change. And so thus diatom is very important for the atmosphere, for prevention of climate change. And thus we should worry about, say, how warming oceans is affecting them. Because if, as predicted, it will then uh, decrease the productivity of uh, diatoms, this then has global implication. Um, uh, diatoms have an interesting way of reproducing. Uh, their uh, casing around themselves, the frustule, uh, then has two halves, an epitheca and a hypotheca. And if you've seen petri dishes, it's kind of like those where one is slightly smaller than the other and fits inside the other. When diatoms reproduce asexually, they do so uh, by uh, splitting the two halves, and then each half then makes a matching half. However, the matching half, which is then synthesized, is always smaller than the original. So what happens is as diatoms reproduce asexually, uh, one of the two halves, the bigger half, makes a hypotheca, which was the same size as the original hypotheca, and it remains the same size as the original mother cell. However, the second one, where it was the smaller of the two halves that makes a still smaller half, now it is now reduced in size. And then the next round of cell division, that smaller half of the two 
will make an even smaller hypotheca. And so one lineage of these uh, diatoms just gets smaller and smaller as time goes on. At a certain point, um, then it is just too small. And so at that point, when it's too small, then it's time uh, for the diatom to kind of reset itself and start over again at which point it reproduces sexually. So when one lineage just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, because every time that it uh, replicates, it's the smaller of the two halves, which is making an even smaller hypotheca. Uh, then um, uh, uh, the nucleus undergoes meiosis, all right? Uh, some of the cells may have flagella. And so uh, these, uh, after meiosis then, um, these haploid cells, once again, they, they may be flagellate. Uh, uh, the haploid cells will find each other, uh, uh, fuse to make a new diploid cell. Now, this could be from this, you know, one original, or it could be, you know, the haploid cell from one diatom over here fuses with the haploid cell from another diatom over there. This now makes a new diploid cell. The diploid cell then makes a new frustule uh, with two new halves of the original size and the cycle starts over again. So uh, just as we saw with the ciliates, and not only is there the possibility of asexual reproduction, uh, but then there's also the possible uh, possibility of sexual reproduction. But then also as we saw with the ciliates, um, these eukaryotes have had two billion years to specialize. And so sexual reproduction in diatoms has some unique features not seen in the sexual reproduction in um, uh, in uh, others. And so once again, uh, the, uh, and the hypotheca is the smaller of, of the two uh, halves, um, and the epitheca is the larger of, uh, of the two uh, halves. And they once again are made of uh, silicon, uh, which is uh, you know, why both diatoms and radiolarian can contribute uh, to, uh, uh, to church. So um, uh, diatoms can exist singly, uh, they can exist in uh, colonies of chains, as you'll see here. Uh, once again, because of the silica of the uh, frustule, uh, then uh, you know it also often has this glassy, uh, uh, this glassy uh, appearance uh, here. All right. So uh, this video, once again, and this the video I'm making now is just an overview of all of these other videos. Uh, this uh, then um, is, uh, has images that you might use to identify, say, in lab. There are lots of groups of protists, and now for a couple more. Uh, one group includes the parasites which cause malaria, which needs to be considered because of its devastating effects on, uh, on humanity. When I first started uh, teaching, it was estimated that malaria had killed about a million people per year. It's uh, now less than half that, which is a great tribute to the, uh, the efforts to limit malaria, which have been uh, done. Um, however, you know, still hundreds of thousands of people a year die because of this protus. So it's one of the single most uh, serious uh, causes of human uh, mortality, um, certainly when it comes to uh, infectious uh, agents. Um, its life cycle is complicated, and I know it's hard to think that you know one celled organisms can have life cycles with different forms, um, but uh, they can. And so uh, the form you know which um, uh, and then infect uh, red uh, blood cells uh, then um, uh, matures uh, inside uh, red blood cells to infect others, uh, but this then can change uh, in the body of uh, the mosquito. And now a mosquito can transmit it uh, from one uh, person to uh, another. Now, uh, uh, it is a eukaryote, uh, but it is a parasite. And going back to this original image, um, it can then exist inside other cells. And so in the background, it are, these are human red blood cells that lack nuclei, human red blood cells lack nuclei. Um, but these then are the eukaryotic cell plasmodium living inside the, um, the eukaryotic cell. So there are different ways of being a parasite. 
uh, the trypanosomes, those were those purple euglenozoans, uh, they were outside uh, the human red blood cells, uh, but were a parasite uh, for humans causing disease. Um, these uh, protists are inside uh, human red blood cells uh, causing, um, uh, causing uh, disease. Um, then uh, moving on, uh, there are uh, protist uh, groups which are called algae. All right, now diatoms can be called a form of algae. Dinoflagellates can be called algae. Euglenozoans are a form of algae, all of which can produce, uh, uh, perform photosynthesis. And then there are other algae which we refer to as green algae that you can see here being dominant in freshwater. And then there's also red algae and brown algae. Um, now, um, uh, these then vary, and as I'll stress in just a little bit in a different video, they are not closely related at all. And so while we call them algae, conferring that idea that they're performing uh, photosynthesis, uh, we should be careful um, in thinking that uh, algae then describes anything about them uh, which is useful, because uh, they are unrelated to each other. Uh, for the most part, red algae are kind of related to green algae. Um, they vary in their habitat. So um, brown algae and red algae are primarily uh, marine, while green algae are primarily fresh water. Um, sometimes they can live as symbionts inside other organisms. Uh, some of them can uh, prey on other organisms. Uh, some can even be parasitic, but this does not apply to all uh, different um, members of the group. Uh, they have pigments which allow them to perform photosynthesis, um, but there are different pigments, and this then, you know, can give them their different uh, shades. So it's the chlorophylls which make green algae green, although some red, red algae are also green um, because they also have chlorophylls. Um, but brown algae can also have fucoxanthin, which gives them a brown uh, shade, uh, or a phycoerthrin and phycocyanin, which gives them a, a reddish shade, so they can vary in uh, their uh, pigments. Um, how they store energy uh, can uh, vary. Um, once again, these are uh, relatively unrelated uh, groups. Certainly brown algae are uh, unrelated. Uh, their cell walls are made of uh, different uh, uh, substances. Um, uh, there are unicellular green algae. There are multicellular green algae. Uh, all of the brown algae are multicellular and most of the red algae are multicellular. Uh, and so uh, when we say, you know, here are some algae, once again, the term algae is only a loose biological term. It's actually used to describe a number of organisms uh, which are completely unrelated to each other. If you look at green algae under the uh, microscope, just to pick uh, one uh, group, you can see that some green algae are unicellular, all right, and Chlamydomonas, which we'll see in a second, uh, is an example of that. So the organism is the single cell. Okay. Um, but then there are colonies, uh, like a Volvox there, or these long chains of Spirogyra uh, here. Uh, so uh, these are colonial uh, uh, organisms. Um, uh, here's also another green alga, Ulva, uh, which we can see. Um, some of the red algae and brown algae can be quite long. I mean, brown algae include the kelps, all right, which can be, um, you know, over, uh, you know, 100 feet uh, long. Uh, so uh, notice that uh, algae can vary. So here's a diatom, it's a single cell, here's a dinoflagellate. Uh, some are colonial, um, but then some are actually multicellular with uh, differentiation of uh, tissues, as in, you know, the cells of the brown alga, which are the holdfast. Uh, which anchor it are different from those which are performing uh, photos, uh, photosynthesis. So here are a number of things which are called algae, and they're not really that closely related. Red algae are kind of related to, uh, to green algae. So if you look at uh, the green algae, it's part of a family tree. The red algae split from it. Notice here is a red alga, but it actually does look green because um, this group does uh, share uh, 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 chlorophyll, uh, but then uh, green algae are a group. But we could actually then split green algae into groups. So here's one lineage, here's another lineage which is more closely related to plants. So some green algae 
are more closely related to land plants than other uh, green algae uh, are, and that will be picked up later. So here is brown algae that's not related. Here is a complex red alga. Once again, some red algae look green. Um, uh, and uh, it has complex reproductive uh, structures. Uh, so that lineage split from the lineage of plants uh, before the, um, uh, the lineage here. Here's uh, some uh, uh, Caraphata uh, green alga, and these are very closely related to uh, land uh, plants. So using the term algae, you know, includes lots of different um, uh, organisms, and we'll get into the uh, uh, the groups which are uh, important in the evolution of land plants uh, when I talk about uh, land plants um, uh, presently, or, or I'm sorry, in a uh, future video. Once again, here's uh, one of those red algae. Uh, red algae vary a lot, as you saw, um, but some of their reproductive structures are are very complex. So, you know, we often think of, oh, you know, plants are so complex and algae are so much simpler. Um, but red algae can have very complex reproductive uh, structures and brown algae include the kelps, uh, which can act, you know, obviously be huge. Um, and, and so uh, algae are, uh, can be multicellular and are often more complex uh, than people give them credit for. Moving on, there are a couple of uh, groups of protists, which are referred to as slime molds, that aren't really closely related uh, to each other. One of the features which we can see in uh, this is usually when a cell divides, the nucleus divides in what is known as mitosis. And this is followed by cytokinesis, where the cytoplasm divides. But the two don't have to always go together. And as you'll see uh, here, you can have a division of the nuclei, so there's lots of nuclei, without the division of the cytoplasm, so that the, um, you'll see just this mass of cell stuff that isn't split into discrete cells. Now you can see slime molds uh, very often if you just kind of peel back the uh, bark on, say, a rotting log, uh, where uh, this uh, slime mold forms this uh, really intricate, um, uh, this really uh, intricate web as it secretes enzymes and then absorbs the nutrients. So they can be decomposers, which are important in recycling uh, the uh, nutrients uh, from dead material. And as you can see here, because the cells have not split themselves up with cytokinesis, you can actually see currents of material flowing through um, this uh, branching uh, set of, um, uh, of extensions, um, uh, once again, because this, plasma, uh, this cytoplasmic streaming is occurring in an organism uh, where the cells are not, uh, are not separate. Okay. Um, another group of uh, protists uh, worth mentioning are the coanoflagellates. Uh, most people have never heard of these, but out of all of the uh, protist uh, groups. These are the most closely related to animals. So if you were to make a family tree, this, these are the sister of the animals. And in fact, sponges are made of, site, of cells called coanocytes. That's their main cell type, which look an awful lot like these coanoflagellates, uh, which are free living. Um, and whether it be cellular, you know, anatomical uh, similarities, were genetic ones. Like for example, there's a very important set of genes called receptor tyrosine kinases, which kind of mark the animals and are very important in animals. Um, the only protists known to have them are the um, uh, coanoflagellates, showing kind of a sister group once again. Now, animals are multicellular and coanoflagellates are not referred to as multicellular. Uh, but that being said, um, Coana uh, flagellates, they can hang out in colonies briefly. And so this is potentially of interest because this colonial organization of Coana flagellates might potentially be the precursor to the multicellularity uh, which we see uh, in, uh, in animals. So Coana flagellates are important for that uh, reason. Um, 
as I start to then wrap up, you know, after going, you know, through many of the protist uh, groups, but not all, um, sexual reproduction is obviously something we associate with animals. And then if one were to think about it, obviously then plants as well, flowers reproduce uh, sexually, fungi can reproduce sexually, um, but so can eukaryotic protists. And so um, sexual reproduction uh, was invented by early uh, eukaryotes. The heart, uh, so here we see bacteria, which are just uh, dividing asexually. And uh, some protists are asexual as well. Dinoflagellates are asexual. And these eubrimozoans are uh, asexual. There are advantages to not being uh, sexual. Uh, so for example, if you're asexual, your population can grow more quickly. It doesn't take two to reproduce. Each individual can reproduce. You can be by yourself and reproduce. Your significant other doesn't contribute bad genes that could mess up your offspring. Um, uh, when we get into animals, you know, one could make arguments that there are additional disadvantages to, um, uh, to uh, sexual reproduction. So for females, very often reproduction is more costly for, those, uh, for them. They have to um, spend more of their own nutrients. So here these female snapping turtles have to migrate to a place where they can lay you know, these nutrient-rich eggs, something the males aren't doing. This puts them at risk of uh, predation. That's a risk to the females. Here, this, uh, these bison, obviously the females carried uh, the young inside their bodies during pregnancy. They're producing milk for them after um, birth. And so uh, a lot of the costs of reproduction can be borne by females more than males. And so that you know, could be considered a disadvantage for females. Uh, for sexual reproduction to work, two organisms have to find each other. Often, one is more obvious, being more brightly colored or making a courtship song, um, but that would expose it to predators uh, so that not only do the, the female towhees know where this towhee, this male towhee is, um, but also anything that would like to eat the towhee knows where, uh, exactly where it is. Um, in the subsequent um, uh, slides, uh, these turkeys. Uh, so they're making so much noise that all of the coyotes in the area know where the turkeys are. And the same thing with the frogs at night. All right, the female frogs are hidden in the dark and not likely to be eaten. Whereas the males are making so much noise that you can hear them from a great uh, distance uh, away. So for sexual reproduction to work, two organisms have to find each other. But there's a cost in that where males might be more likely than to die of the, uh, suffering uh, predation. Um, and so there are advantages to uh, reproducing asexually and there are disadvantages to reproducing sexually. But there is one advantage to sexual reproduction that compensates for that. The advantage is that it creates genetic diversity. So much so that, for example, in humans, two humans, because of two events that happen in meiosis of independent assortment and crossing over, two humans have the genetic potential to make more genetically different human, uh, uh, more genetically different children than there have ever been human children. That's an incredible degree of uh, diversity. So these tadpoles vary because they were produced through sexual reproduction. The fish in the next scene vary because they were produced through sexual reproduction. <coughs> and there's an advantage to this variation when the environment changes, like a new uh, disease. Uh, uh, you know, the world gets colder, the world gets warmer, there's a new predator. If the population varies, some of them are likely to make it. All right. And so um, a sexual reproduction helps the population in increasing its odds of survival when the environment changes. And it was the earliest eukaryotes which invented this process of sexual reproduction. Now, obviously in animals, you know, there are organs involved and glands and courtship rituals and all of, uh, of these types of things. Um, but at the heart of sexual reproduction is simply two different types of cell division. While mitosis producing diploid cells happens most of the time, at a certain point of the, cell uh, of the life cycle, the cell undergoes meiosis, a new type of cell division, which produces haploid cells with half the number of chromosomes, which then fuse together to make a diploid cell and the process starts all over again. It was the earliest 
um, eukaryotes that invented that. All right, so even though we may look at these you know, animals and think of sex, and we think of sex with animals, um, nevertheless, it was the one-celled eukaryotes which invented sexual reproduction, um, which benefited uh, from the increased uh, diversity. Okay, a couple of final topics as I start to uh, um, uh, wind up. We can still see a variety of symbioses. So for example, here are wood frog eggs. Look how green they are. Because there's a symbiosis where inside the yolk of the frog egg, um, there are lots of microorganisms. You can see them swimming around. And they would include green algae. And this is probably a symbiotic relationship in that the green algae can produce oxygen and maybe even sugar for the developing frog embryo. But the frog embryo is producing carbon dioxide, nitrogenous waste, and a place to live for the green algae. So if you look inside an egg, you can find this animal egg has protus living uh, inside of it in a symbiosis. Now it's just called a symbiosis because uh, the cells aren't living inside other cells. They're just living uh, together. So, you know, green algae can live in frog eggs. There's a ciliate, which is living in uh, the frog eggs. And so there are a variety of symbioses uh, which uh, can occur. But sometimes there can even be endosymbioses where you can see animal, uh, I'm sorry, cells living inside other cells. Sometimes this lets an animal perform photosynthesis. So here, once again, it's inside the wood frog egg. But for example, corals are animals that can perform photosynthesis. There are green worms and there are giant clams which are green performing photosynthesis because they have green algae living inside the cells of the animals. As far as I know, there is only one vertebrate where an endosymbiosis is known. And that is a salamander in the Northeast United States. The spotted salamander um, can, have green, uh, uh, can have green algae um, living inside uh, the cells of the female salamander. And when she lays eggs, the uh, green algae are then actually in the eggs of, um, uh, of uh, the larvae, but not just in the eggs, but actually in the cells of the larvae themselves. So here you can see spotted salamander egg masses. Uh, they are uh, green, um, but the salamander larvae will actually have some of this green algae inside their own cells. Once again, the salamander is giving a place to live, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, um, but the algae is producing oxygen and uh, perhaps sugar. So it is a symbiotic relationship where both benefit and it's called endosymbiosis because one is living inside um, uh, another. If we were to uh, consider all of the protists, I haven't even considered all of the ones alive today, um, but there were ancient uh, protists, um, or mostly protists anyway, uh, which we identify in the fossil record. Uh, now, because we can't analyze them, uh, you know, we could make arguments. Uh, would some of them be um, actual protists or might they be, you know, casings of animal or early animal embryos, et cetera? It's hard uh, to say, um, but in other words, they're, they're, in, uh, they're called acritarchs. It's probably not a biological group. It's just all of these you know, microscopic uh, things uh, in the fossil uh, record, um, which uh, are uh, eukaryotic, but we're not quite sure uh, what they are. They might be more of a diverse group, but nevertheless, they're useful in studying um, habitats. Uh, and, and so, you know, we learn about the fossil record by studying their diversity, getting an idea of habitat um, uh, diver uh, diversity, uh, but also then of some major extinctions. And so there are times when acritarch diversity increases. There are times where lots of them disappear and are then replaced uh, by uh, others. And so the fossil history, we get an idea uh, from uh, so uh, once again, that's an interesting uh, set of organisms. And you know, as, uh, if we study the fossil record, if we're on, uh, asking, you know, what was going on early in life's uh, history, these are most uh, they start their diversity in the Precambrian, um, but then in the Cambrian Ordovician, there's a, a great deal of acritarchs, and so the acritarchs are uh, increasing their diversity at the same time the animals are. 
And so it may be that, uh, you know, this was important in early animal evolution, you know, with uh, filter feeders and uh, the like. Okay. Um, the final topic, I'm sorry, before getting into the, the final topic, just another mention. There are a number of protists I haven't uh, really uh, mentioned. Uh, so relatives of brown uh, algae uh, are other forms of heterocont algae. So uh, notice um, uh, that we have uh, some di uh, diversity here. So there are red algae and green algae over here, um, but diatoms are here, brown algae. But there's other forms of heterocont algae. And uh, in the Northeast United States, where I am, here's a you know, relatively common heterocont alga, which uh, can be found uh, you can see it swimming about with uh, flagella uh, um, uh, in a colony. Uh, and so once again, I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, there are so many different uh, protist uh, groups. And even though this isn't one of uh, the major ones, uh, it could be in a pond uh, near you. The last topic is just uh, biologists are, to be honest, uh, a little bit embarrassed by the word uh, protist. I know I certainly am. Um, because if we were to list the groups of life, we would say the two kinds of bacteria, there's plants, animals, fungi, and then the protists. But biologists know in their heart of hearts, that's a lousy word, all right? Because um, animals are a group, a good biological group descended from a common ancestor, and there are traits which unite the animals. Um, plants are a good biological group descended from the first plants, and we can list uh, uh, traits which plants share. Same with fungi, but not so with um, uh, with uh, uh, protists. Okay, so um, the problem is because they're small, we use so many terms loosely. All right, so for example, we can say, "Ah, oh, there is an amoeba." Well, actually, the animals which, can, or I'm sorry, the organisms which can be called amoebas, some in this group, some in this group some in this group, and it turns out they're not related. They're completely separate branches of uh, the protist family tree. Which ones are called algae? Well, there's green algae, there's red algae, there's golden brown algae, there's all of these different kinds of algae that aren't quite uh, related. There are different groups which are called slime molds. Um, there are different groups that when I was uh, studying in school were called fungal-like um, uh, uh, protists. Um, and so we use these terms, but very often like amoeba doesn't mean anything biologically because this group of amoeba isn't closely related to this group. Um, uh, you know, algae doesn't necessarily mean anything. And if you look here, coanoflagellates are protists, but their cousins are the animals more so than other protists. Here you see our fungi, their cousins are microsporidia, a group of protists whose closest relatives are um, uh, are fungi, not another group of protists. Here you can see that uh, green algae are related to land plants, and some green algae more than others. So we don't consider plants to be protists. We don't consider animals to be protists or fungi to be protists, but animals evolve from protists like the coanoflagellates. Plants evolved from the um, uh, the protists like the green algae and fungi involved from protists like uh, uh, like microsporidia. And so this family tree doesn't include all groups. And if you were looking for traits which unite the groups like, so animals, you can say, here's something that all animals share. Um, it, you can't really do that with protists, name traits that they share that exclude the non-protists. So for example, some are unicellular, some are um, uh, multicellular. Uh, and so uh, that trait, multicellularity, or at least you know, the ability to be colonial, uh, seems to have evolved at different points in the family tree. Uh, there are different points where secondary uh, symbioses uh, have, uh, have evolved. And then finally, here's, there's a term we use in classification called paraphyletic. Paraphyletic is a name for a group that includes some of the descendants of a common ancestor, but not all of the descendants of a common ancestor. So when we use the word protist, 
all right? Protus includes all of the descendants from the first eukaryotes, except for the land plants and the fungi and the animals. The plants, fungi, and animals are just as much descended from the first eukaryotes or as are amoebas and paramecia and foraminiferans, etc. But we exclude them from the word protist. Therefore, protists are not a natural group. They're not a real biological group because they include some but not all of the descendants of a common ancestor. A good biological group includes all of the descendants of a common uh, ancestor. And so protists are paraphyletic. And as such, it is not a good biological uh, group, okay? But then the problem would be uh, that protists have so many groups that their phylogeny is actually rather messy. And biologists, you know, change their mind with new uh, evidence as to, you know, whether this group of amoebas is on this branch or that branch, et cetera. And so while protist is a lousy group, it's better than any of the replacements, which would then just be more uh, complicated. And so um, it's unfortunate that by using the term protist, we're kind of punting in a way that we're, you know, it's not the terminology and the classification system that we should use. Um, but nevertheless, uh, for beginning biology students who are surveying the life on Earth, um, the more correct alternatives would probably be a bit more you know, complex and a bit more time than we can afford to spend. So, two billion years ago, a new type of cell evolved on Earth, a eukaryotic cell. And in the two billion years since then, uh, the descendants from these ancestral eukaryotes have produced lots and lots of lineages, which we call protists, but then also uh, three other groups which are either multicellular in the case of plants and animals or mostly multicellular in the case of fungi, uh, which are then descended from uh, these protists.